I mean, the, the average of, of black kid today, I think, is probably uh, better off, certainly materially, than, uh, say, ben, ben Carson was when he was growing up. Ben Carson, the famous uh, black surgeon at Johns Hopkins. Right, right. Uh, who I is think, immensely accomplished in every way. Yes. Right. Uh, I would say that um, certainly the black kids who uh, are growing up today have a higher material standard of living than I had. Uh, the only the diff difference was that uh, the schools were good when I came along. They were especially good in New York at that time, hard as that is to believe. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the kids who grew up in that same place where I lived, they will not get that same education. Now that can be blamed on somebody, but it has very little to do with what happened uh, 100 or 200 years ago. And it's true in other countries. I mean, uh, in Nigeria, for example, there's a tribe, the Igbos, who are living in one of the least, least fertile parts of Nigeria, uh, who were in fact enslaved uh, in centuries past by other tribes and so on. Uh, when, when the British moved in and set up schools, the Igbos went for the schools. By the time Nigeria became uh, independent, the Igbos had climbed above the other groups that had been ahead of them uh, to begin with. So there, but there are all kinds of uh, cross currents of factors, uh, the particular culture or the particular geography, you run through the whole list of them. Here's, you, you cite, in Intellectuals and Race, you cite an observation by the intelligence expert, IQ scientist, James Flynn, that just stopped me cold. Mm. After the Second World War, you've got large numbers of, of American troops remaining in Germany. For that mm. matter, there's still several tens of thousands there today. And both black and white American soldiers had children with German women. Mm. And Flynn discovered that those children growing up in Germany mm. showed no IQ differences at all. Mm. The, the, the black kids and the white kids, the same. Quote, quoting intellectuals and race, Professor Flynn concluded that the reason was that the offspring of black soldiers in Germany, and now you're quoting Professor Flynn, grew up in a nation with no black subculture, yes. close quote. Which means what? Which means they experienced exactly the same expectations? Is this the, the No, 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 the expectations are external. The culture in which they grew up was, was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. So they had- There's no gangster rap. In, uh, uh, that, that, that was pervasively uh, uh, available in Germany. So here's what I'm getting. There is something about black subculture in America today mm. that holds African Americans themselves back? Yes. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I went into this in a previous uh, book on which, uh, about black rednecks and white liberals. Because that same let's, subculture- we'll, we'll, Let's talk about two of your books here. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Because that very sub same subculture held white, whites in the South back as well. That in the time, this, this uh, mental testing in the First World War turned up, among other things, the fact that uh, whites from various, oh, four or five southern states scored lower on the mental test than, than blacks from four or five northern states. And so it really was a question of the subculture that was there, which was a handicap to both. All right. And so whose job is it to say, Wrong subculture, folks. You're, har you're harming yourselves. Well, I would think in an ideal world that intellectuals might take on that task, but uh, the world that we live in, I've noticed, is not, not ideal. All right. <sighs> what is to be done? Take a look at President Lyndon Johnson speaking at Howard University in 1965. Oh, yes. But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. It's, it's pathetic. 
It's not a question of, there's no you who has the control to be completely fair or completely unfair. I mean, the circumstances are, so someone once criticized the mental test on grounds that the tests were unfair. And, uh, one, and I think it was David Reisman who said, the tests are not unfair, life is unfair, and the tests are measuring the results. But who has control of life? Who has control of the past? Who has control of the culture that people have in the present, which they've inherited from the past? Welcome back to Breakdown Friday. Joseph Ward, Patrick Irvin, Professor Carl Tone Jones. We're here breaking down the clip you just seen from Thomas Sowell uh, talking about black culture and black subculture. And basically, black, sub, black culture is destructive. Black subculture is holding us back. But the overall point he was getting at, and I'll put the link to the full video in, but the overall point he was getting at is um, because black people can achieve and can succeed, he's using that to say, but uh, this is why racism doesn't exist. And in some areas, black people are able to outperform white people. So because black people are able to outperform white people in some areas, these are stark indicators that racism, white supremacy does not exist. It's basically what he's trying to get at. So, uh, yeah, Pat. <laughs> What you think, my brother? What you think about the clip and, and, and the points that Thomas Sowell was making against black culture and um, how it's holding us back? Well, his point about gangster rap and subculture is totally based. It's, it's just not accurate, um, especially when you consider that the largest demographic consumer of gangster rap is white kids. So to, to, to blame the failure of black kids to achieve on an IQ test, which has been shown to not necessarily carry a lot of relevance in terms of success, but you know, it, it does have its uses. I'm not saying it doesn't have its uses. I'm just saying like, they're kind of all over the place because you're talking about ment a mental acuity test are a test that measures your ability to integrate and solve problems are a test that measures um your ability to manipulate data are a test you know what i'm saying like this test what what exactly are we using this iq test for which iq test are we using what are the outcomes that we're measuring it up against but that's a whole other thing because it doesn't matter because the group in question is also the largest consumer of the culture that you say is what's holding black people back. So we have a, a, a fundamental like disagreement there in terms of you're pointing at this thing and saying this is one of the reasons black people are failing, but ignoring the fact that that same thing is consumed in larger quantities by a group that is allegedly su succeeding. So then yeah. we have that problem. But then on the other end, what kept blaring over my mind is him his idea that life is unfair, so no one should be blamed for it. Why are black, right? So this is an interesting idea because you only hear it from successful Negroes. Yeah. As a, as a way to kind of, you know, we talk about white guilt all the time. I think white guilt is in a lot of ways kind of being, um, white people are tired of feeling guilty. So they're being desensitized to white guilt. And people like Thomas Sowell kind of helped that happen. But he's also feeling guilt. He's feeling guilt at being one of this, the, the token Negroes that made it through and being looked at by people saying, well, why aren't you doing anything to help the rest of us? There's a, there's a type of pressure that successful black people experience that we don't talk about. And a lot of the ways that they maneuver, in my opinion, is a way for them to kind of soothe their own stress with being out of place you know we talk about the out of place principle which is you know a situation where black people that have achieved the level of success that is uncommon for black people or something that's seen as um abnormal oftentimes have worse health outcomes and worse health of it their health isn't boistered by their increased access to resources in the way that you would think it would be and certain communities, the Mexican community, I'm thinking about in particular, uh, health outcomes for middle income Mexican Americans 
are actually worse than they are for lower income Mexican Americans. And a lot of that is the out of out of place principle. Black people experience that too. I think Thomas Sowell is experiencing that cognitively. Like he doesn't want to deal with the fact that you're a black man that has made it in America despite all of the odds. And now the community might be looking at you with a, a eye of obligation and expectation that you do something for the community and you don't want to deal with that. You don't want to. So because even when he talks about the expectations being different, okay, the expectations are different. But you say, well, expectations are external. Okay. So did black people come up with the IQ test? <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, there's just so many disagree. There's so many incongruencies in what he's saying, and they're all very subtle. Where I can see the argument making sense to people that aren't really paying attention to what he's saying in a very nuanced way, because he's trying to cover the nuance of no. our statements, but. But how, how can the expectations of a group who don't have power over you actually influence you? You have to answer that question. The expect For the expectations to be able to influence a whole group of people, they have to come from a group of people who have more power than them. Well, but even Hence with that... external expectations. And, and I'll land my plan here, but when we're talking about culture, we got to understand, like... Culture is a product of your environment. You get three people in a room together, you leave them in there for a week, they will develop culture amongst them. All right? Culture is something that happens. It just is. If your culture is not working for you in the moment that you exist in, then there are a few things at play. One of which could be that the environment you're currently in is not the environment that the culture was produced in or that is conducive to survival in that. So then you have friction. You got to make cultural changes. The other of which could be that you haven't been permitted to develop culture naturally because there has been an external force acting on the collective that is retarding the natural development of culture. So when we start talking about culture and, and counterculture and all these other things, because counterculture is a real phenomenon, but people really don't dig into it. Counterculture doesn't just happen. Counterculture develops when there are a group of people it's a necessity. right, that can't access resources and the things they need through participating in the natural cultural system. So they develop a separate cultural system that usually operates counter to get what they need. It's a compensatory necessity. So if we're talking about counterculture in the black community, then we still are kind of pointing the finger at American culture. Why is it that black people need a counterculture? <laughs> well, you know, he has a lot of incomplete points, but you know, uh, uh, PC went away. So <laughs> <laughs> he went away, but no, I, I just say my, I'd say it's a bit of my piece because no, I wrote down a whole lot of things that he was talking about. Of course, you know, I had more time to sit with this than you all. But um, he in the beginning, he talked about black children having more material things than uh, black children did when when he was young. And you could basically see him using that as a measuring stick of progress for black people. So because black people spend more money on material things, this is a clear indicator that black people have made uh, real tangible progress as a people and put themselves in a greater position of power. Well, we can look at, we can look at black economics. I mean, we can look at the, the myth of the buying power. Yeah, we can, we spend this much money, but we lose this much money. And we still, as a group of people, don't have aggregated wealth. Why don't we have aggregated wealth, Thomas Sowell? You think, you think black, because at one point, black people work together. It's not like black people never work together in America. At one point, black people work together, but something happened, Thomas. So something happened, <laughs> and, I, and and black people stopped working together. We talking about external uh, expectations or external 
influences Thomas Sowell, what we talk about. But PC, what well, give us give us your thoughts on on this clip and 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 some of the points that Thomas Sowell was was breaking down and what 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 which one of the points really stood out to you in the beginning? Well, I'm glad y'all pointed out it was Thomas Sowell because, um, you know, I couldn't tell. I thought it was too white. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, um, and my allergies have been bothering me. So, you know, um, but, so today's been one of those days. And uh, I think I would, it didn't really kick back in until we watched the clip. So, you know, I guess I'm allergic to bullshit. Um, so, <laughs> I chew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I jot down a few things. First of all, you know, um, Pat, you know, beautifully covered the the part about you know uh, gangster rap and his so called influence. When you actually understand that, you know, first and foremost, these are sixteen and seventeen year old kids at the time that were producing this music, and they were doing it as a reflection. They weren't, you know. Um, you know, philanthropists, they weren't um, scholars, they weren't, you know, they didn't see themselves as influencers. Actually, you know, they actually took a page. Um, when you talk to a lot of them, they took a page out of, you know, what Public Enemy used to provide, what some of the conscious rap used to provide, but they added it, their experience, their, you know, the street life experience to it. Now, how it was exploited, that wasn't black people. That was the same people that funded private prisons. I'm just and saying. Exploiting it. And, um, you know, people like Leo, Leo, listen, Leo Cor, Leo Cohen, Leo Cohen, Leo Cohen, Jerry Heller. Yeah. So those weren't black men at the time. And, you know, certain certain types of music that made it to the airwaves and they made it where they could make it to the airwaves. And we talk like it wasn't a protest against that. You know, we, we, you know, people black have people like a, a revisionist history, you know, see, see Dolores uh, Tucker led a campaign right out here in Philly and eventually led to congressional hearings. These these young rappers were chased off of stages in every state they went in. They were arrested on stage. They were thrown in jail many times for performing these songs. So they act like it was no pushback to this in terms of the, uh, the you know the culture that was put out there. You know there was, but at the same time, disassociating as an economist, he's supposed to be an economist. This this disassociating the uh, economic conditions that caused a lot of the, you know, um, that caused a lot of the problems that these young people dealt with. And they were reporting it because they saw it as them reporting it, not glamorizing it, but reporting it at the particular time. So, it, you know, this really speaks to a guy that grew up being ostracized. I would love to learn his life story. Like, I would love to learn how he came up, um, whether or not he felt ostracized from the black community. Because when you do a deep, deep dive, it's kind of like a scientist who say um, that they hope that eventually a... a you know, a virus will attack the human beings because we're uh, a virus to Earth and our population. We're causing damage, so the Earth needs to survive. In order for it to survive, it needs to eradicate itself of the virus that is people. And then you look into the background of these scientists, and you find out they grew up scorned. They grew up hurt. So they don't give a damn if the world falls apart because they don't have any love for the world. Thomas Sowell doesn't give a damn about the black community because he has no love for the black community. So when he talks about um, the black community, he wishes that the culture didn't exist. Everything he speaks to speaks to being um, assimilated. And assimilating to culture. When you talk yeah. about black Germans, assimilation into culture because there's no black culture. So black culture is bad, or is it impoverished culture is bad? Is it the fact that derived culture, deprived culture is bad? Because when black people did build in this country, everywhere black people built, white folk followed and burnt it down, flooded it, ran, uh, created an infrastructure where becoming significant and so forth. Every opportunity, laws, policies put in place. So you're talking about laws and policies doesn't matter, but the same laws and policies are still applicable to today. The Dred Scott decision still is seen and shown today. When black people are in the streets, and um, especially at the hands of non-blacks, we see that there is no right of a black person that a white man is duty-bound to respect. We still see that stuff. So to play that game, is really disingenuous, but it, it actually is a little worse than disingenuous. It's criminal. It's intentional. Right. Well, see, this is the same person that... Well, so he talked about the Ebos in Nigeria. 
Let's talk about how they took to education. Not only did they take to education, but they also took to cultural change. They wanted to be white. You find Nigerian men now, many of them adore white women. White, black, adore, black women adorn white and European men over in Nigeria. They adorn because they were colonized. And they themselves assimilated. Their court system, they, they're still wearing wigs. They're still wearing white wigs in their court systems. So, you know, I mean, I could say a lot more, but, you know, it basically comes down to a man who has, see, I, see, I don't, I don't, I, this is one place I'm going to disagree with Pat. I don't think he feels guilt. I think he has a burning level of vitriol and disdain for the black community because at some point he wasn't accepted as one of ours. He wanted to be seen as something major, somebody accomplished. But we look at him the same way we look at Larry Elder. In fact, I will I, I honestly say Larry Elder is blacker than he is. <laughs> That's hey, <laughs> when, when, you know when the left when the left wing uh, white people when they name a black person they name Thomas Sowell. He's the only one. I mean, shit. <laughs> uh, Thomas Soul was the name that was used to break down um, the black manosphere when Pearly Things was out there talking about who she was going to quote black Same. scholars and so forth. So Same. when you have a, a racist white supremacist like her quoting Common Soul, you got to ask yourself whose benefit, whose community does he really benefit? And with that, I land my plane. He, he benefits.